Good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning, uh, Raj. Good morning. Raj, you can start the next session. Yes. yes. Indeed, a great privilege to introduce uh, my teacher, Dr. Universal Center on the address to as MRS sir, sir professor and head of the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontic, the Manchester Dental College and Law. An alumnus of Madras Dental College, sir has a rich teaching experience of more than 30 years and is a recognized PhD guy this university. With over 50 publications, and Lifetime Achievement Awards in this cap. Sir had been the president of IACD and organizing chairperson for IFIA World Endodontic Commission. He is currently the president of our state association, Conservative Dentistry and Endodontic Association in North America. What to you, sir? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mahalishma Man, Dr. Rajkumar, and the team for inviting me to moderate the session in which Dr. Vidya is doing the lecture. Thank you, madam. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Vidya Hari. Dr. Vidya Hari Iyer finished her undergraduation from Raga's Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Vidya Hari is a passionate dentist, physiotherapist, psychotherapist, counselor, and an entrepreneur. She's the director, founder of Dr. Vidya's Smile Dental Clinic, Chennai, She's a consultant dental surgeon, implantologist, laser specialist, gold, cosmetic, and aesthetic dentist. She's presently a faculty at the Indian Academy of Golden Gold Foil Operators and is also an associate member of the American Association of Gold Foil Operators. She completed, completed her post-graduation in medical legal system in 2003. Dr. Vidya Ari Hayer. Dr. Vidya Hari Iyer completed her post-graduation in ops, hospital and healthcare management in 2004. She is a biomedical and, and dental waste management consultant. She has authored a book, Going Green, a manual on waste management for dental practitioner in 2007. She is the only dental surgeon to be in the panelist of Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board since 2003. She has been conferred with the state honor of a uh, sprawl honor for bio dental waste management by the honorable vice chancellor of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Minja Medical University. She has received a Dr. Abdul Kalam's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. And also recently, she also got the Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan Best Teacher Award in 2021. It goes on knowing Vidya for more than 20, 30 years plus. It's a pleasure to be moderating her lecture She's a young, energetic, I'll call her young again because she's always bubbling with enthusiasm. Today morning, she returned from coaching after a big program. She is always energetic and enthusiastic in giving lectures. Thank you, Vidya. You can take on. Thank you so much, MRS, sir. Uh, being your student uh, for the last 32 years, uh, I guess I have not, I've never grown out of your umbrella. Everything I do, I've always consulted you. You've been my friend, uh, my philosopher and guide for over 32 years. And it's a pleasure being on this podium. Uh, thank you, Mahalakshmi, ma'am, uh, for this great opportunity. Thank you, Rajkumar. I guess Rajkumar and I again go way back 32 years. And uh, we have done everything, uh, singing, dancing, uh, studies, everything uh, together. Uh, thank you, Vidya, and uh, thank you, Balagopal, sir. It's an honor uh, sharing the entire podium with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, at the onset, I would definitely like to thank the organizing committee of the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, SRM Ramapuram, for this kind uh, you know, honor and privilege to be standing in front of you today and uh, wishing Pulp 2022 a grand success. Uh, I was just listening to the entire, uh, you know, the lecture from the morning today, and it has been so amazing. I feel like a student again. I feel I should have heard all this, uh, you know, many, many years back. I, I guess I would have had a greater a focus and a direction towards future. So such a noble thought, 
uh, by Mahalakshmi ma'am and the entire team to cater a kind of a, a absolute palette of things for the students. I guess the students are so blessed and lucky to even hear uh, this. So thank you so much. Uh, my first topic of today's presentation would be pick the right bin, biomedical waste management, the do's and the don'ts. So I will go ahead with the presentation. Just let me know if you're able to see my screen, ma'am. Mm, not yet. Yeah, just give me a second. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen yeah. now, ma'am? Yes. You can go ahead. Okay. So uh, uh, I would like to first tell you, delegates, that you know all of us want to practice uh, dentistry the right way, right? So till around 2002, 2003, I always used to wonder uh, that you know we uh, we use gloves, we use masks, we use head caps, and uh, nothing much was happening after we use these uh, you know uh, self protection equipment, and all of us used to just throw it in one dustbin, and that dustbin used to go into a landfill, and they used to burn it up. And that is how uh, waste management was, okay? So those were my growing years. And uh, every time a stench used to come from this air, which was uh, thrown into the uh, you know atmosphere, I used to wonder, isn't this the same air that I breathe? And what is it that I am doing towards this? So all these thoughts, like Kundabala ma'am said, like, you know, this, uh, you need to sit and the best person to sit with is yourself. Like Swami Vivekananda said, uh, if you miss sitting uh, time with you, I guess, you know, you're missing the most important person in this entire world. So as I used to sit and ponder over this, uh, when I was working in the Department of Conservative and Dentistry and Endodontics at Raga's Dental College and Hospital, uh, these thoughts really overwhelmed me. And that is when I started looking towards my baby steps. I had enrolled in a program uh, that is uh, the bio, uh, that is the you know the hospital and healthcare management by Symbiosis Pune, and then I realized there was so much more to this waste management. So the first part of this uh, session is going to be the topic of waste management, the do's and the don'ts, and then how simple techniques can be followed by each one of us in our practices also and in our dental setup or in a college setup in large so that we can bring in some uh, changes in the environment and we can preserve not only the air, the soil and the atmosphere totally, the mother earth uh, in uh, you know, large. So what is biomedical dental waste management? It is basically any waste which is generated either in the diagnosis or in the treatment or in the laboratory or in any research uh, work, right? And we have something called the infectious waste, which is the waste which has the potential to transmit viral, bacterial and parasitic diseases. And the hazardous waste, which is has a potential to pose a threat, not only to the human life, but to the vegetation, to the animals and everything around us. Why are we even talking about this topic today? Because uh, there are 11 categories of biomedical waste as it is given in this, but this is an old rule. Today, we have only four uh, you know, classifications and I'm going to throw some light on that. So these were the classifications which have, were given a uh, you know, before, uh, not anymore, because this became a lot more complicated in the beginning, right? So why are we talking about this is because when we don't segregate the waste at source, we are trying to bring all of them together and the entire waste becomes harmful for us. So what are the infectious waste? These amount only to 15% and these are the sharps, the non-sharps. This could be the plastic disposables, the soiled non-plastic items and the liquid waste. The hazardous waste are only 5%. Those are the radioactive waste, the pressurized containers, the chemical, the cytotoxic and the incinerated waste. Now, when we don't segregate the waste at source, we are mixing all of them together and potentially the entire waste becomes infectious and hazardous. 
So what does this all mean? According to the biomedical waste management rules of 1998, uh, and uh, with this rules actually was set up by the central government and then followed by the Environmental Protection Act and the Pollution Control Board at the state level. However, the act came into effect only in 2000. And uh, then we had further amendments in the act in 2003, 2011, and the recent amendment, which was in 2016. So the new amendments, I will go through each of these points because they are very important. See, uh, I'm sure most of us, uh, in a general uh, you know, scenario, we all know that the chlorinated plastic one-time use bags have phased out. Right now, if you go for shopping, you will not have any plastic bags. In fact, if you want to uh, get the plastic bags, you need to pay for them. And this rule was set up by March 27th, 2019. And any laboratory waste, you had to pre-treat then and only then send it out. And you have to provide training to all healthcare workers. Healthcare workers includes the students, the staff, the entire auxiliary staff in a dental hospital. And we all need to immunize. I'm sure we were talking about hepatitis B immunization few years back now, but for the last three years, we are also talking about the COVID, uh, you know, the immunization. And now I'm sure all of us must have got the first, second and the booster dose by now, right? Next is to establish a barcode system for these bags. Now, why the barcode system? It is because these uh, barcodes were very specific for the hospital from where the waste was collected. And any major accidents, when I say major accidents, I mean any needle stick injuries or any kind of an obnoxious gas, that is the dioxins and the furans which come out, all this was supposed to be reported and produced in front of the pollution control board. Biomedical waste now is now classified only into four simple categories instead of the previous 10 or 11, and this was to improve the segregation at source. The new rules have been made it more stringent, and this was, uh, you know, followed by the CEA or the Clinical Establishment Act. Now, this came into being in 2016-17, but came into force in 2018. And I'm sure all the dental clinics, at least in Tamil Nadu, we were all, uh, you know, very pro for this, and we had registered with the uh, Clinical Establishment Act, and we were ready to get our clinics, uh, uh, you know, inspected by these inspectors. And uh, we had to follow a certain set of guidelines. So there were a lot of inclusions and the limits of uh, the air in the atmosphere, that is the dioxins and furans, especially at the treatment facilities. And no occupier can, shall establish an on-site or nobody can say I do something within my operatory that cannot be done. No secondary handling of waste and constant monitoring and inspection. So the biomedical waste management rules actually are six in number. You have to minimize the waste. You have to reduce, reuse, and recycle. You segregate the source at uh, you know, the point at which the source is generated. And then the treatment, you decontaminate for any infectious waste. Storage also has to be very careful. Transportation within labeled vehicles and the final disposal. So this is a simple flow chart. You actually segregate the waste and after it is segregated, you store it at a point, then transportation within the healthcare facility, then to a common storage and then transportation outside and then treatment before the final disposal. In schedules, we have six different schedules. You have schedule one to six. The schedule one is categories of waste. Schedule two is color coding and type of contaminator with a container which has to be used. Schedule three is label for the biomedical waste containers and bags. Schedule four is how to label the transportation. Schedule five is standards of treatment and disposal of the biomedical waste. And stand, uh, schedule six is the schedule for the waste treatment facility. So now it is very simplified, my dear friends, and we'll go in detail that what goes into each of these bags in the next few slides. You have a yellow bag, a red bag, a blue and a white translucent, either it could be a puncture proof container and a black plastic bag. So in the yellow bag, whatever you put, it will be incinerated and deep burial would be done. Now, what goes into these bags would be anything which can be incinerated. It is your gloves, your, uh, I'm sorry, it is your cotton, it is your, uh, you know, your, uh, 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 
bodily parts it could be your extracted tooth the red bags will have your gloves your mask anything which is plastic in nature which cannot be incinerated these are autoclave they are microwave and done with chemical treatment your blue white uh, translucent uh, boxes which is a puncture proof containers all the in ingredients of these containers uh, will be soaked in sodium hypochlorite and then autoclave microwave and chemical treatment and then final destruction and your black bag which is again it's going to be into a secured landfill so why are we talking about this it's because the dental patients and the dental healthcare workers are exposed to a variety of microorganisms i'm sure during the pandemic when the whole world said put your masks up we were the only people who said please put your mask down we need to work in that place right so we know that we are exposed to a variety of microorganisms and this could be due to the blood the oral and the respiratory secretions so what is the universal standards or the universal precautions they are eight in number i'm sure all of us know about hand washing i will go uh, two three slides into that the use of gloves the proper use of personal uh, protective equipment the use of uh, you know fluid uh, gowns which are, are fluid resistant in nature so that whatever spatter of blood or saliva does not get into your clothes safe handlings of uh, sharps safe handlings of anything which is going to be uh, you know waste which is uh, which is going to be say, uh, sent out from your uh, clinic safe handling of your soiled linen and definitely environmental uh, cleaning okay so all these are the standard precautions so when we are talking about personal protective equipment i'm talking about anything from your head to your toe right now we wear the head cap we wear a mask we wear double masks sometimes then we have uh, you know our uh, gowns we have gloves we have our footwear again which is covered with a, uh, a footwear cover so all this has to be worn and in addition to this you wear your goggles and your safety shields so whatever jewelry is there you need to remove it. and wash your hands before you get into such uh, pre uh, the personal protective equipment or the ppe kits as we are uh, call them you have also the surface barriers you have to cover all the non critical areas use of plastic bags is very important and all the surface barriers are those areas where you will touch with your gloves after you have maybe put your hands into the patient's mouth so they could be a secondary source of infection carrier so it could be your light handle your trip like so the three way syringe your suction tubings your counter tops and your mobile work stations the surface disinfectant you can use anything which is semi synthetic phenolic don't use glutaraldehyde or sidex because it could be corrosive in nature all the protective barriers you can clean the surface which is uh, being contaminated and do it between each patient so between the two patients you will have to clean up and wear appropriate gloves you need to wear something called the heavy duty gloves uh, like shown in this picture so that there is no penetration in case or uh, you know there is no touch or contact of the uh, microorganisms so wipe off any grass debris using a moist paper cloth and as i told you these are the areas even the switches of the chair in case you are touching it you have to uh, see that you have a blue uh, you know cover which is covered for each patient and uh, this is very important especially and see that your patients know that you are doing all this infection control right global hand washing day is observed in october 15th and uh, i'm sure you understand we need to have a barrier between the microorganisms and our hands should be protected so this is a union which we do and how do you wash your hands i'm sure all of you know about this but just let's go into it so when you start washing your hands first remove all the jewelry which your hands might have it could be your needle uh, it could be your uh, you know nail or finger rings it could be your nails cut your nails and and uh, and uh, remove any bangles or anything which is going watches which is going to hinder in your process and next you wet your hands you take your soap solution and nicely go all around your hands go between the web of your fingers go between your nails and then clean up at least up to your wrist and then towel dry uh, and uh, completely wait for your hands to be dried before you wear on your 
gloves. Now, in case you're using an alcohol-based uh, formulation after you've done this hand wash, then you can uh, spray the alcohol uh, formulation and just don't uh, rub it only on your palms. Again, the same uh, story holds good. You have to go between your webs of your fingers. You have to crisscross your fingers. You have to go between your nails. And then, if possible, try to go between each finger and do it for both your hands and then let it dry for at least 20 to 30 30 seconds before uh, you can go ahead with wearing your gloves. Now, how do we disinfect the operation theater or any place which you are doing or an operatory, as we call it in our clinical setup? So mix with, uh, you know, any detergent uh, mixture, you can use it, mix it with water and remove all the spills around the area where you are operating. Uh, this is because you want to remove any proteinaceous material uh, before you go ahead with the proper cleaning. You can neutralize it by using a formaldehyde fumigation system, which can be used like how you do it in a surgical setup. Otherwise, you can also take a cotton ball and pour around 10% of ammonia onto it and leave it in the room, close the room, close all the doors and windows for at least four hours. And before stepping in and doing any procedures, uh, try to do the sterility test or the score test. I will show you some score indicators also. You can disinfect also with the ultraviolet radiation. I'm sure these ultraviolet tubes and bulbs came into a lot of uh, importance, especially in the last two years. You can use that too. And uh, wipe equipments uh, with a wet cotton, giving special attention to the foot switches. See, as a dentist, you need to have a complete coordination with your eye, with your hands and with your feet. So even your foot switches should be uh, cleaned or uh, disinfected even before you go ahead with the next patient. Equipment shall be disinfected by wiping with 70% isopropyl alcohol. Now, what goes into the red bag, as I had instructed before, you have all these things which are plastic in nature or have a plastic fill-in. So your gloves, your mask, your suction tips. When you're discarding your suction tips, you will have, when you look at your suction tips in a very close quarter, you'll have a metal lining inside to hold the suction tip. So you can use a heavy uh, wire cutter Cut your suction tips before disposing them. You have these uh, uh, head caps, you can dispose them. All your, uh, you know, your gowns, your uh, surface counter gowns, your gowns for your uh, patients or your, uh, you know, the covers for your patients, all of this can go into the red bag. You can wash them, especially when it is the uh, gloves, like I told you for the suction tips, you can cut the fingers before you put it into a um, uh, solution of sodium hypochlorite, you can soak it for about 30 minutes and then you can put it into the final red bag. So these are the infectious ways which you can put it into the red bag. And it is very important uh, that, you know, they are not reusing it. I'm sure there was always a threat of the gloves getting rewashed and reused. And uh, now uh, all that has actually come to a standstill. It's because of cutting the fingers of the gloves before disposal. Next is indications for sterilization or disinfection of the dental instruments. Generally, these dental instruments are classified into three main categories. They are the critical, the semi-critical, semi and the non-critical. When I say critical, I mean that, you know, when you put it into the oral cavity, it has a quality to penetrate inside. For example, I could say the GMT, wherein, you know, you're going to use it, it's going to touch the tissues, it's going to touch your uh, enamel, the dentine, the soft tissue, it is going to touch. So these are your critical instruments. Semi-critical are instruments which is not going to directly touch, uh, you know, uh, come in uh, contact with the um, uh, body fluids. Now you can take your amalgam carrier. Now that is going to be a semi-critical instrument. A non-critical instrument could be your triturators, your day pendition, things like that. Maybe even your x-ray units which you're using. So let's go deeper into this. So surface disinfection for the critical items, you have a you look into the instruments which are used. These are what goes directly into the body, touches the body fluid, and these have to be cleaned. So it could be any instruments in dentistry, your forceps, your scalpels, your bone chisels, your scalers, your burrs, all of them come into this category. The sharp instruments and the needles, these are potentially infectious. So they need to be handled with care. Please do not recap your needles. I'm sure uh, this has been taught in your oral surgery department. 
once you remove the cap you have to either if you want to recap do it with a single hand technique or it is better you use a needle cutter and then burn uh, the needle uh, this is the best way of handling that needle stick in uh, injuries are on the rise and hepatitis b uh, could be a kind of a transmission which could happen of course aids and others are also in uh, you know in a higher up when you use uh, or when you get caught with this needle stick injuries so all your irrigation uh, syringes irrigation syringes used in endodontics i'm sure you have uh, various irrigation solutions which you use uh, to have a effective endodontic procedure right so all of that your reamers your files all those small small sharp instruments your uh, burrs your abrasives all of them keep them into a puncture proof for resistant container before you dispose them now what are the advantages of having a needle cutting instrument it is that it will reduce the volume of the dangerous sharp so because you are burning them you are you know you are uh, removing most of the infection part here itself it becomes easy for you when you transfer and it also eliminates the needle stick injuries especially in the rat pickers in the community and by the uh, you know innocent uh, pet animals which are seen on the roads right next is the white color you have the uh, puncture proof containers which come in transparent white or you know the white uh, translucent colors and you can put uh, labels over them the vernacular languages can be used so that your staff who might not be as literate as you can understand the, what they have to put inside and sometimes even pictorials uh, can be represented so that you know there is no mishap there infectious glass sharps especially when you are using vials for uh, transfer of medication ampules all of this also you can put them in a cardboard box you can color it with a blue marking and then give it separately to your uh, you know this final disposal so these are the puncture proof containers as i told you you have it in i stay in tamil nadu so you can see it uh, it's written in tamil and all these um, you know drawings have been given so my staff find it very easy to put it inside such uh, bags next is the heavy duty gloves as i had told you before please give this to your uh, cleaners who are ever, who are using them to clean your instruments as a student i think we do multiple roles so it's better to buy one or two heavy utility gloves and keep it especially when you are cleaning your instruments uh, and uh, you know wash it and dry it completely so that there is no cross infection later many a times i have seen uh, even when i was working as a staff i have seen many students have a lot of skin infections because of this uh, wet uh, the gloves that they used to wear for a longer period of time and uh, so always better to remove your gloves if your procedure has gone more than 40 45 minutes remove your gloves wash your hands dry your hands again and then wear on your gloves because hand hygiene is very very important my dear friends needle stick injuries do not transfer needles and do not recap this is the uh, absolute important uh, point which you need to take back home today semi critical instruments are instruments which do not disrupt your uh, you know mucous membrane you need high level disinfection for this it could be anything which are non sharp instruments and uh, they are not going to penetrate into your soft tissue so this is very important and uh, you can use high level disinfection in uh, um, uh, you know solutions to clean that map and then of course go ahead with your auto cleaning procedures your non critical instruments are instruments which do not touch the patient directly so uh, it is all uh, anything which is external so any low level or even medium level or intermediate level disinfection should do you can just clean and wipe them and uh, use it between each patients so again it depends whether you or your hands are also contaminated as you use these instruments so always see that you are also not your hands are also not contaminated and even the patient is not going to have any penetration Thank you. Next is how do you pouch your instruments? Now, when you pouch your instruments, I'm sure now all of us use these pouching uh, machines. We have the pouch packs given. So, whenever you pouch your instruments, see that you put the non, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, touching or instrument or non-invasive part of the instrument down, and uh, they put the invasive part of their instruments up. So, always see that when you are doing something like a needle uh, cutter or a needle, uh, you know, holder, see that the uh, hand part of the needle goes inside and the shaft is always outside and then you fold it strap it and then you auto clave it so i'm going to show you two uh, very important videos i from start to finish so that you will be able to appreciate what i'm trying to say so this is one video for all of you do watch it
I'm sure as a student, you would have all understood the entire process because most of the time we are not involved directly in the process. Maybe our, uh, you know, nurses in our departments help us with this procedure. But as a clinician, as you're stepping into the world where you might have your own practices, I think it's very important to understand the sterilization and disinfection of your instruments, of your operatory, of the entire setup of your dental practice. So just little inserts into what all we did. We used an automatic cleaner. This removes all the proteinaceous layer. You don't have to pre-soak it. And this will minimize the exposure to blood or any body fluids. You also have autoclaves. I'm sure you've learned this in your microbiology classes. And it is very important to use the manufacturer's instructions for each of these equipments and follow it verbatim. I mean, there is no two ways about this because this is you, you are supposed to be caregivers. You are not supposed to try transfer nosocomial infection. Glass bead sterilizers are highly effective, especially because it rapidly heats up your instruments. It is portable. It's very small in size. I'm sure you have seen it in your uh, clinics. And now you can use these uh, glass bead sterilizer for all your shops and small instruments. Your chemical indicators or your spore checks, these are very important. You need to check it. And in the video also, you saw the color being pink in the initial stage. And after the steam or after the autoclaving, you saw it, the color had to change to brown. Now, this is very important for each instrument bag to be checked whether the color change has happened. And these indicators are very useful and they are a part of every packaging strip that you buy hand piece sterilization. I'm sure most of us as students will have or buy only one hand piece. But uh, as you become a clinician, it's better to have two or three running hand pieces. When I say running, I mean working hand pieces. So this is very important so that you can sterilize these hand pieces. You can autoclave them. Again, follow your manufacturer's instructions and see that you nicely oil them and then keep them in sealed pouches. And uh, you also have hand piece sterilizers also available. And uh, these have to be sterilized between two patients. Please do not use them just like that. And at least for 30 seconds, if you uh, you have to pre-flush it, which means, you know, the negative pull of the valve you have to do because you have both air and water coming out through your hand pieces. The saliva ejectors, I told you, can never be reused and there is a metal tubing. So please cut them with heavy duty wires before you put them into your red bags. 
Now, uh, the three-way syringes also, now you have the disposable three-way syringes. You can use these disposable three-way syringes. As the name indicates, they are disposable, so don't reuse them. And in case you don't have them, you have the metal uh, three-way syringes. Uh, generally, the chair company gives you two or three. You can buy them. They don't cost much. And you can autoclave these also between patients and then keep reusing them. Rubber dab. I guess rubber dab is something which all of us are now getting exposed, even as a student from your third year. When we studied, it was more of a spotter. And by the time we came as a house surgeon, that's when we learned how to use them and we started working on it. But today it is more mandatory considering the pandemic and of course giving a better outlook towards your work. Now, when you're using these rubber dam, they are a sharp instruments also. The clamps are sharp, so be careful autoclave them between patients and uh, try to minimize uh, the droplets so uh, as you take out the rubber dam see be very careful because you will have a saliva laden inner wall of this uh, uh, you know the rubber dam so please take it carefully and put it into the red bag now the surgical instruments uh, you have to sterilize instruments in an autoclave and in case these instruments get uh, dull when i say dull it means they are no more sharp they, you cannot use them uh, or uh, you know you can't do anything with them and you want you intend to throw it away please give them to the metal vendors uh, where they uh, recycle uh, these uh, metal uh, instruments now for any of these sharps i told you you can put them in sodium hypochlorite solution you can autoclave you can put them in a puncture proof container or uh, sharp disposer and give it to a waste management facility. For dental healthcare workers, initially it was only hepatitis B vaccinations. Now the COVID vaccinations are also very important, not only for the healthcare workers, for everybody, even for your patients who walk into your practice. What goes into a yellow bag? As I told you earlier, it is your cotton, your gauze, or any soiled linen there. Next is your tooth. But see that the tooth which is extracted does not have amalgam. And any of your body tissue parts, especially when you're doing biopsies, you might want to throw some of them and leave a little for your histopathological analysis. So the rest of the things which you intend to throw, all that goes into the yellow bag. And these yellow bag con uh, contents have to be inserted. Incinerated. So anything to do with, uh, you know, removing out of your body, the bandages, the linen, all of that can get into the yellow bag. Next is something which is a student's nightmare when you go to collect a uh, tooth, right? So any extracted tooth, you have to see that you clean them. I showed you the ultrasonic cleaner. So you can place these teeth in ultrasonic cleaner so that all those proteinaceous layers, the periodontal fibers, all of that can be removed. Then you store them in a fresh solution of sodium hypochlorite. At least one is to 10% is a good. And then only you start taking and working with them. So please uh, do these things. Even if somebody has given it to you, you try to do this procedure and only then use it. So what if a tooth which I have extracted has amalgam? Now then you place it in a separate puncture proof containers because the recyclers are there who extract the amalgam and the mercury part from this uh, teeth before they uh, put it into final disposal. Any glasses or ampules or uh, syringes which are glass uh, in nature, all of them see that they, they are breakable, right? So you put them in puncture proof uh, boxes or cardboard boxes, label them as glass before you send it for recycling. And this is generally the kind of the bag which you have. You have to mention from where it has been generated, who is generating it, and the signature of the person who's giving. Even in your basic autoclavable pouches, like you saw in the video, a date is written and the person who's doing the procedure has that name has to be written. Because in case there is any mismatch, we can find out who has done that particular batch. Disinfection of gutta percha points, 70% isopropyl alcohol, 20% chlorhexidine or 5% sodium hypochlorite is used because generally we don't pre, uh, you know, disinfect them and keep. So it is mostly on a chair side procedure. Disinfection of your counter uh, tops and surfaces, you have to see that any splatter of saliva, blood has to be cleaned between patients. When you make impressions and before you transfer it to your lab, you see that uh, you disinfect these, uh, uh, you know, these impressions and only then give it because they might have saliva and sometimes even blood, uh, frag, uh, you know, on these impressions. So wash it properly in running water. You can use a gentle brush also to remove any uh, 
uh, you know, blood stains. And then this is, so, uh, we know that, you know, whether it's a plaster of Paris, the dye stone, the dental stone, all of this, uh, previously we used to just take them and dump it outside, okay? But now we cannot do it because a law has come. I'll be explaining to you about the law also. So these have to be uh, cleaned and disinfected before you take it from your lab to your patient's uh, operatory and before you place anything into the patient's mouth, especially when you're doing prosthetic work, I guess this comes into play. And when you're doing crown and bridges, especially in your endodontic treatments. So gypsum was banned from normal landfill in 2009. So from 2009, all this, you can't just throw it out. See, hydrogen sulfide, which is a gas which was released, and this is very colorless, flammable gas and has a distinct foul uh, smell. And this uh, actually uh, causes a lot of lung infections. The adverse health reactions include breathing difficulties, discoloration of skin and eye irritation. And hence this, uh, you know, just throwing out into the landfill was banned. So we have to put it into secured landfill and only then we can uh, do that. Next are the x-rays which you generate within the clinical setup. The x-rays can be recycled. You can extract them for silver and whatever rest of the x-rays you have, you put it into a shredder, shred them up completely and then give it to your final vendor for your final disposal. So there is imperfect understanding at two levels. That is the lack of appreciation that dentists are actually exposed to a variety of materials, the toxic substances, the hazardous substances, and lack of understanding of how such unregulated infectious and toxic waste can be personally hazardous also for the dentist and the health care workers. And our personal concerns are the aerosol contamination, which comes out through the, you know, high speed hand pieces and the mercury waste, which is a specialized toxic waste, especially when you mix, uh, you know, in a hand triturated system. So why all this? Because of the Minamata Bay in Japan and all the uh, effluent water from the factory, the Chiso factory, went into the Minamata Bay and uh, this crippled not only humans, it also caused uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, damage to the fauna and the flora. So this was a turning point and the rules have come back in 2014. India has to face out all the mercury within six to ten years and this uh, paper uh, came out in 2014. So six years means 2020. We have already crossed that and 10 years is 2024. So we are almost midway there and now it is a turning point where we need to face out mercury uh, that is in the uh, nascent mercury from our practices. So these are the amalgam ways which we used to do. We used to triturate, um, you know, mercury and then we used to put it into the patient's mouth. No more we can do that. We need to use uh, mercury hygiene and I'll talk you about that too. So when we do this, what happens is you need to have a chair side trap and these traps have to be cleaned and thrown out as a sewage into a separate puncture proof container and discarded. They cannot be reused. are actually filtering the water before this water goes out into a general sewage system. So what are the health hazards of uh, nascent uh, mercury when inhaled? You could have the acute exposure, the short exposure, and the chronic exposure. And right from your central nervous system, it can also impair your hearing, your speech, your vision, your gait, your involuntary muscle movements. It corrodes your skin and causes chewing and swallowing problems. This is, I'm talking about nascent mercury. So you can follow mercury with mercury hygiene, use your amalgam capsules, use amalgamators, use high volume evacuation systems, no carpets in your practices and no vacuum cleaners to remove the spill. Mercury hygiene is a separate topic by itself. I generally have videos to show how do you actually work on uh, those mercury spills and how you can make your own mercury kits within your operatory and keep it so that in case there is any uh, mercury uh, spill, you know how to take it. Don't use any household detergent which could uh, react with it and all your ACs or your air conditioning filter should be period periodically checked in case you're using mercury within your practice.
All the liquid waste, you should know how to dispose them. The next few slides will go into each of these in particular. Your lead containing waste, which could be your lead foil packets or your aprons, especially when you're taking an x-ray. Your silver containing waste, I told you how to extract and how you can give it to the vendor. Most of this is done by the vendor themselves. You just need to segregate and keep it safely within your practice. Now let's go with the sodium chloride, which can be used. These are not hazardous. You can just flush the rest into your drain and place it into a red bag. When you're using isopropyl alcohol, especially for disinfection, you can throw the alcohol down the sink, which is, uh, you know, across the expiry date. But please do it in a well-ventilated room and pour a lot of water beyond that so that the alcohol does not cause any air pollution. Right now for the blood bags, especially in the oral surgery department, they are the biodisposable units. They need to be incinerated. You can cut these bags also before putting it out. And if you're using glutaraldehyde, uh, you can use a sodium bisulfate as a neutralizer before you dispose them. Next is your fixer and developer solutions, especially when you use uh, them for your IOPA x-rays or even bite-wing x-rays. Uh, these contain silver, so you have to place them in a labeled puncture-proof container and give it to your vendor for your final disposal. Your sodium hypochlorite solution, I'm sure you're using it, uh, you know, uh, right from your uh, disinfection of your root canal. So these are corrosive, especially because of, uh, of the hypochlorite. Now you can liberate these toxic gases by using chlorine or chloramide which can be mixed with the acid or the ammonia. So you have to neutralize them with sodium thiosulfate and add water before you finally dispose them. Your formaldehydes, again, you neutralize it uh, and then you pour it into the sink for at least 20 minutes with running water and any concentrations without greater than 10% are hazardous, so keep the bottle separate. For the soiled linens, uh, you could uh, dilute that area with ammonia, which are for fresh stains, or hydrogen peroxide, or you can use your vinegars or baking sodas if you are, uh, you know, close to home, you can do that. And clean it up with a cotton swab and only then machine wash it. You can use uh, enzyme detergent um, uh, solutions to remove all these protein stains. Make sure you don't iron these clothes if there are any stains, because once you put the iron over this uh, blood stains, the iron would uh, set the, uh, the heat would set the blood within the soiled linen and it'll never come out. So it has to be very clean before you actually use the dryer or any hot thing. So this chart is a complete, uh, you know, uh, uh, complete protocol chart right from what I started in the morning, uh, you know, early afternoon and now, right? So why are we talking about all this? Because most of our clinics are NABH, uh, colleges are NABH and clinics are ISO uh, certified. And this is to provide quality assurance and quality improvement for hospitals and also ensure patient safety and quality of care. So this is just to say that, you know, you're giving good affordability, efficiency, quality and effectiveness of the healthcare. And standard of care today is very important, especially with the escalation of the medical legal uh, cases. So for the dental waste, which can be segregated into five categories, you have the red bag, that as I told you, it is not incinerated. You place all those suction tips, your disposable tips, everything there. The yellow bag has the cotton, the gauze and teeth without amalgam and all the anatomical waste. Your big puncture proof containers has all the sharps, the small puncture proof containers has all the amalgam fillings and non-contact amalgam and the cardboard box can be kept for all your dental materials and separate cardboard box for your glasses also. So these are the few guidelines on the table of the uh, operator. You can have a small waste collector and these waste collectors, you can place the cotton and gauze, especially when you're trying to wipe the area for work. And you can have labeled bags, uh, colored dustbins with appropriate stickers. Here is a short video just to help you understand the waste management.
So as you saw in this video, record maintenance is very important because you're subjective to inspection anytime by the Pollution Control Board or your Dental Council of India. And this is very important, especially when you're practicing dentistry. So the biomedical biodental waste management, you can have a chart in your operatory just to tell you that you are an eco-friendly dentist and you work towards preserving your soil and the water along with the air. So these are the color-coded bins. You have the puncher-proof containers with the labels. You have collection of the effluent water. And this is the method where you can have it the central storage and uh, you know help them in transportation and authorized vehicles. So for the generators of waste, that is how I started the, uh, you know, the entire uh, lecture today. So we, uh, there is a great concern about protecting ourselves from cross infection using uh, universal precautions. However, we need to understand the ethics and follow it to the verb so that, you know, we uh, don't uh, cause any harm uh, to the areas we uh, practice, especially because most of us practice in residential areas, right? So what is the golden rule in justice? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And what is non-maleficence? It is that, you know, you have an obligation to do no harm to others. And uh, in dentistry, we are thinking about iatrogenic diseases, faulty restorations, and failure to sterilize your instruments. So according to the medical negligence, uh, you have a lot of landmark uh, judgments. But to just name these two, a doctor is only found guilty if they fall short of any standardized reasonable medical care or negligence when they have not followed a particular treatment regime. And the doctor does not need to have the highest expert skill to perform any procedure if they know the basic standards. So as Tuckdale said, practitioners should always be on guard against untoward incidents, for it is never known when such an incident may escalate for actions for damages. Never assume that the trivility of the alleged injury to the patient will exonerate the operator from any legal action. So this is according to the Constitution of India, the Article 21, which says about the right to live. It is bound to us. And again, the revised code of ethics, especially of 2014 of the Dental Act, we need to understand only these two, 3.6 and 4.1, where 3.6 is highest quality assurance in patient care and 4.1 is obligations to the patients. And uh, we cannot just pass the baton. We can't say that the dental auxiliary will take care and it's not the doctors or the dentist's uh, work. We need to understand that the hands that heal are the hands that protect the environment. And uh, we are good citizens who care about protecting the environment. And as Mark Rich said, he believes that the profession will embrace science-based source reduction and recycling programs. I would like to thank my alma mater, Ragas Dental College and Hospital, for helping me to do this study way back in 2002, 2003. It's almost 20 plus years now. The Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board, with whom I'm associated now for the last 20 years, toxic links for a toxic free world and my practice for being my backbone for whatever I've shared today. A few few milestones, as uh, Dr. Amaris had told, the Going Green a book, which was published by Oral Hygiene Day. And uh, today this book is sold for almost 500, 600 rupees. It's only available on Amazon right now. So you can pick up the book. Most of what I have shared has been a part of that book. And I have also updated few, which you might not see in that book. I was honored by Dr. Meer Mustafa Hussain, the Vice Chancellor, the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University, for my work. And I have been a part of um, the work representing the Ministry of Environment and Forest Government of India, the CPR Environmental Education Center, Chennai, the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board, working in unison with a number of medical and dental colleges. It's a pride for me because I'm the only dentist and probably the only woman on this panel. And I also represent a lot of state and national and international conferences. Uh, and uh, this is one such conference which happened uh, in Trichy uh, way back. And uh, it also gives us a lot of responsibility to shoulder. 
I also do these trainings for dental assistants as workshops because they are the first handlers of these wastes and shafts and disinfection. And it's very important to help them understand their role, mostly because they are not educated. They are sometimes only eighth standard or 10th standard. They don't understand the job they have come for. So these workshops, especially in unison with the Indian Dental Association, has created a lot of uh, positive ripple effect on the, uh, you know, the entire dental fraternity and it's a pride that I have represented uh, uh, to pass a number of bills especially in New Delhi uh, where we have these uh, you know table conferences uh, where only selected people come and I have also represented uh, from All India Institute of Medical Sciences to release a number of uh, articles on BS management. Thank you so much Mahalakshmi ma'am, Dr. Rajkumar and Dr. Vidya for this wonderful opportunity and thank you MRS sir. Uh, you know being uh, has been such a proud privilege. I hope I lived up to your expectations. Thank you my dear friends for your patient listening. Any questions I'll be there to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Vidya, for that wonderful, exhaustive presentation. Uh, I think we can uh, take the second lecture as well. I know you can still go on for hours together <laughs> to talk. <laughs> so we will take the next lecture and then go on to the question and answer session. Okay. So do I start it right away? E yes, please. You can. Okay. So friends, the next topic is a continuation of what I spoke today. Uh, towards the end of the lecture, I did talk about the ethics, right? So I'm going to talk about the code of ethics in dentistry. And let me share my presentation to help you understand this better. Just a second. Ma'am, just let me know if you're able to see the presentation. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Yeah. So uh, is it visible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you can go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, friends, uh, our next topic is, you know, the ethics in dentistry. Uh, I'm sure we had a small chapter in community dentistry when we were uh, learning about it, but it has a lot of essence in everyday dentistry, right? So it is very important for house surgeons as you step out and become the doctors uh, and when you go into the society to practice dentistry, it is very important for you to understand what are your duties, what are your roles and, uh, you know, regulations. So the doctor is in inherent uh, duty the law and legalities evolved to actually defend the doctor and protect the interests of the patients and a brief inquest into the guidelines of do's and don'ts are all that is going to be rehashed and presented today in a new frame right so this is designed to motivate your insight into these otherwise mundane topics which seen uh, in the light of the conferences so thank you so much ma'am for picking up these valuable topics so that uh, the house surgeons understand their importance uh, and what all these mean. So as Jovid defined law, he defined law as a rule of action to which people make their conduct conformable, a command enforced by sanction acts and forbearance of a class. It caters to the needs of the society and it's recognized by the state. So this is how law was defined. And what does it imply to you and me? Hospital is basically a temple of healing. Doctor, you and me are saviors of mankind and medical profession is noble in nature. So when you look at the medical profession, I'm not separating dental here because all of us come into this big umbrella. It is a branch of learning science, which means we need to keep updating ourselves. And then we need to practice it. We say practice because as we do it, we get better at what we work. And it is also for treating and preventing the disease as a learned profession. What is ethics? Ethics denotes the moral obligation or conduct of a superior class of men, a study of what is right and what is wrong in the human conduct. And jurisprudence is defined as the philosophy of law. It concerns with the principles of positive law and the legal relations. 
There are a few theories of ethics. These are the utilitarian theory, which means the way you utilize these ethics, the deontological ethics, which is the morality of the act rather than the consequences of the action, which means with what intention you did the work, the virtue ethics, which means what a virtuous person would do during a particular situation, descriptive ethics, which means you define a good or bad or moral or non-moral notions, and prescriptive ethics, which carries a mandate force and joined with some kind of an authority which you carry forward. The macro ethics are a set of principles designed to protect the human dignity, the integrity, the self-determination and confidentiality of the persons you work on. I'm sure with the social media, these confidentiality patterns are changes because, uh, you know, many doctors post with their patients who are celebrities and, you know, it's all in the social media. Nevertheless, what treatment has been done and what has been done on them should not be revealed. The rights and health of a population and the people comprising them. So what are the aims of teaching ethics? It is to understand the behavior of the patients and the fellow doctors, identify value responsible for decision making, recognize the elements of ethical controversies in profession and their moral values. And value is defined as the belief and the attitude to motivate behavior which is dynamic and may change with time and circumstance. It's mostly a thought-based concept. What are the advantages of the code of ethics? It maintains the dignity and honor of a medical profession. The standards are exalted. Its sphere of usefulness is extended. There is an advancement of science which is promoted and members of the association understand clearly their duties and obligations towards the profession towards the patients and towards the community at large. And I'm sure this Association of Indian Association of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, especially on the Cons Endo Day 2022, are doing exactly to uphold the code of ethics of the profession, right? So the dentist code of ethics regulations came in 1976 and it came into force in August of 1976. This is the Nuremberg Code of Ethics. The principles were reinforced by the declaration of the Helen Scheme. And this was adapted by the WMA, which is a World Medical Association in 1966. So what is compromise? A compromise is a device when one is willing to reject a part of his belief and substitute uh, with the other so that the change which is made is agreeable to both the parties, right? And you have the ethical principles which are governing the professional behavior. And they are five in number. And my dear friends, you need to understand all of these five and I'll be running through them in detail. The autonomy, the non-maleficence, the beneficence, the veracity, and the justice. So what is anatomy? An anatomy means, autonomy means, uh, it is defined as the principles of respect for the person. In the sense, you try to describe your treatment plan to your patient. And uh, on the funny note, if you look at this picture, you can understand it was a case of extraction. So here, on a funny note, especially they are saying like, you know, you can use a boxer hand, you can use a door, or you can use your forceps. So Similarly, you need to explain everything to your patient and to get their consent and their decision before you start going to do a work. You should fully uh, inform the patient of the do's and the don'ts and allow the patients to judge for themselves. So this is autonomy. Confidentiality, as I had told you before, this is in terms of the communications which you have had with the patients and the record maintenance. Never gossip about a patient, especially if it's famous personality or a particular neighbor. And patient's permission is definitely sought for before you put it in the social media, my dear friends. Otherwise, you can be litigated. Confidential, uh, confidentiality can only be breached in two areas. That is in the court of law and when the patient changes the dentist. And any unlinked information can be given in conferences where you can just say a patient came and this was done and, you know, that was, uh, the treatment was done. Most of the pictures which you show for patients should have their eye covered. Either you can block the eye because that is an iris recognition is always there. And you can re restrict your photographs at least only to the oral cavity, except when it is in a smile design case when you have to take the permissions. The non-maleficence is an obligation of do no harm. As I told you before, you have to see that you're preventing any risk uh, and you're doing anything what you're doing is going to be beneficial for the patient. 
What is beneficence? Beneficence is a principle of promoting what is good, kind, and charitable. It is a promotion of being, uh, you know, having a well-being. You prevent evil or harm. And uh, don't be paternalistic. When I mean paternalistic is you should not withhold any information. You should not give restricted choices to your patient. And you should not make choices for your patient. So these are the three very important things which uh, terms you as being paternalistic. And uh, this uh, refers to the healthcare professionals where they insist on this particular treatment and they believe that that is the best violating the patient's uh, kind of an autonomy to take a decision so again we need to be very careful because in the court of law this would not hold good what is veracity veracity is a principle of truthfulness and honesty a healthcare professional should be truthful, should keep promises and refrain from deception. When I say keep promises, now imagine you have told that you're going to complete uh, the root canal uh, treatment within a particular stipulated time. And then you suddenly see an acute flare up and then you're thinking that this is not going to get over within the stipulated time. It is bound by you to tell your patients that see this is a usual uh, you know flow of case but in your particular case there has been a flare up and we need to work on it in a slow pace I can't do it fast because your body is reacting to the treatment because it's an acute or a chronic case so whatever it is be very transparent in this discussions with your patient so that you know your veracity and everything is very transparent in front of the patient Next is justice. So do want to others as you would want others to do want to you. It's so very important. See, you and I are dentists today. Tomorrow we could be patients and probably uh, you are all you know around 20 plus years junior to us. So there might be a condition where I might come to one of you for my dental treatment. So the way I want to be treated is exactly how I should treat my patients. It's so simple if you look at it and give others what is due to them, especially like uh, uh, how Dr. Kundabala said. I mean, if there is anything you're doing and if there are many hands or heads put into the making of it, you need to give your credentials to each one of them. Treat patients also fairly and equally and distribute healthcare resources with equity, equity, efficiency and effectiveness. Don't say that I would not treat one sect of patients. Even if an HIV patient comes to you, you should follow the universal standard precaution and not send off a patient because they are, uh, you know, uh, tagged or, uh, you know, labeled as something else, right? So why all this? Because a uh, landmark judgment was based, uh, play, uh, done by the Justice J. Krishna Iyer. This is a historic decision which said hospital is an industry and education is also an industry by the Industrial Dispute Act 1947. And this act is a central act which means it governs the entire India and doctor which is you and me we are workmen according to the industrial act and under section 2 by 5 it stated that any person employed in an industry to do any manual unskilled skilled technical operational clerical or supervisory work for hire or reward is a workman so what is a professional service? You and I are still laborers. So what is a professional service? A professional service, according to Jackson and Powell, said that we have committed to moral principle and professional duties. And professional association uh, is there, like, you know, IDA, say so many of them which regulate and upholds the standards and it maintains the high status in a community. So what are your and mine duties? Duties of a doctor include to be sober, to be courteous, sympathetic, helpful, model, and punctual. When you say you want to be on time, be on time, my dear friends. Don't make your patients wait. Morally, mentally, and physically clean, which means don't take money from any of your associates. Don't take money from those labs which come to you and say, I will give you a cut if you send me a patient. All this actually is not allowed according to the rule. Enroll yourself in societies and associations and follow the rule of conduct which that association uh, demands out of you. 
update yourselves both in knowledge and the skill because dentistry is defined as the art and science so it is not only about the science it is also about the art or the way you have to improve your skill set do not let down your fellow dentists if somebody has not done a good job don't label them down tell them probably something went wrong and let me do it right for you so don't put down your fellow dentist duty bound to treat your family and that the, the fellow dentist family for free or at a nominal fee uh, whatever suits you at that particular point of time whatever a uh, patient and a doctor we interact it's called a contract and i'm sure all of us today we all maintain something called the informed consent i'm not sure how much it is there in the dental college setup but in the clinical setup all of us follow this informed consent and i will go a little more deep into that so a legal foundation of the doctor patient relationship is the contract law the dentist expresses all the professional opinion which that patient has to know and depending on the choices which this patient gets they take an ultimate choice and give the information that they want to get this kind of a treatment so we have to understand that this is a informed consent or uh, it is uh, uh, you know a contract between two people two individuals and both are in agreement even before you go on to the dental chair so this is uh, my clinical uh, you know case sheets this is what i maintain in my practice so i take down all the personal information i also take down the medical information the past medical history the present medical history and if they are a woman we find out if they are pregnant especially when you want to take uh, you know the x rays and find out about the habits find out what medication they take what are their allergies they go through uh, and what is the dental information that the present dental information with which you want to do are they regular with their brush are they regular with their uh, you know dentist in terms of six month scaling all this have to be uh, you know taken down even before you go ahead with the procedure next you need to take the patient signature now at this point of time if they are people below the age of 18 you can have a surrogate signature and the surrogate signature could be of the parent or the guardian who is accompanying that minor the clinical examination again you need to write down the chief complaint in the patient's own words i'm sure you've learned all this in your medical uh, you know um, uh, classes and also when you came into the third year of dentistry you also maintain exactly all the diagnostic uh, tools your dmf uh, tools and which tooth is tender on percussion any rct is done any crowns so everything in detail has to be written and then what are the suggestive uh, you know uh, uh, recommended treatment procedures you want to do any investigations you want to do it could be x rays it could be blood it could be anything so you have to maintain all that and get the informed consent the date and the time even before you put the patient on the dental chair so this is before you get any treatment done on the patient and they have to sign these informed consent you could have specialized informed consents these are the additional informed consents which i have for my uh, implant patients for my ortho patients uh, because we will be doing a lot more work which could be invasive on these patients and also get their feedback just to help them understand what they are uh, you know undergoing so this is predominantly a patient doctor contract and this is as i told you for the uh, implant case and uh, get their feedbacks also because it is very important for the patients to recognize the kind of work which you do uh, this sets you apart from the crowd uh, especially because you are giving a chunk of your time your life into your profession and only you will be able to profession you know you'll be able to practice uh, passionately uh, your profession for a longer period of time when you follow some ethics within your practice so remember this acronym brain for an informed consent b stands for benefits r is the risk a is the alternatives i is the intuition and n is nothing so the vicarious liability means if you have a dental setup and if there is a, a, a you know your associate doctor who's doing a treatment and if they have done something wrong according to the vicarious liability that the liability or any case put forth will be put on the main or the chief doctor and not on that associate or the uh, assistant doctor so this is very important 
importance. It is always very important that you look into all the cases completely. Now, medical negligence, as we understand that no human being is infallible, which means all of us make mistakes. So please don't uh, get upset if you have, uh, you know, exposed a tooth pulp. We can understand that the tooth pulp horn might have been a little more higher than necessary as you were preparing your class one or your class two. So it is understandable that all of us can make mistakes. But however, exposing the tooth is not a problem. But if you don't know how to manage that exposed pulp horn, that is an, a problem, right? So a mistaken diagnosis is not negligent. And doctor is held in the guilty only when he falls short of the standard reasonable medical care. So after exposing that pulp, you should know how to manage that pulp or the deep caries management and keep the tooth or watch the tooth over the months and see that you have restored the pulp uh, properly uh, without doing any other major uh, you know, damage. So this is fine. And especially uh, when uh, this uh, landmark judgment came, the blow, uh, the bolum versus the fry and hospital management, they said doctor need not possess highest expert skill, which means uh, it is not like only an MDS can do something well and a BDS can't do. So it is not that it is about you understanding what is the importance of having a good clinical setup with the good intelligence of diagnosis and execution of your theoretical knowledge. So as Tarkdale said, as I had told you before, medical negligence is that, you know, we need to be understanding that uh, we, uh, we need to be on watch out if uh, I could say uh, that anything which you do uh, wrong, we need to inform the patient so that uh, the patient is on guard and we are on guard and you can always be empathetical towards the patient. So what were the traditional causes of malpractice? It was extraction of a wrong tooth, ill-fitting dentures, broken root tips left in the bone, infections are after extractions or adverse reactions because of a uh, injection. Now, this was the traditional causes. I'm sure you and I have had a lot of pun intended jokes on dentists because of this. But what are the recent causes of malpractice? Uh, they are failure to inform or obtain an informed consent, your diagnosis, your reference, your treatment. Faulty patient history. I'm sure uh, just a day before, um, I didn't want to put up here because I didn't want to defame any dental college, but uh, because of faulty or, uh, you know, negligent patient history being put up, uh, entire dental college has put into suit. Uh, uh, so this is very important, my dear friends. And I'm telling you this because all these cases are coming up in recent times also. Third is treatment beyond competence of practitioners. I'm sure there are a lot of CDE programs, the continuous dental education programs. Do a lot of hands-on work. Be abreast with whatever you're doing. Update yourself time in again. And only when you're confident, go ahead and do the work. Failure to inform the patient if there is any fractured instruments, roots, or prognosis involving any procedures which you have done, especially in implant dentistry. You have a difference between a failing implant and an ailing implant. You need to tell the patients what it is all about and abandonment of the dent of the patient by prematurely discontinuing care and not attending to the needs of the patient under treatment so these are the five top recent causes of malpractice so what is the iceberg phenomena one percent of your clients if they have any problems they will lodge a formal complaint which is a potential negligence claim but 10 percent of the top uh, you know uh, uh, complaints they don't complain but they would go to any elsewhere dentist. So that is a loss of income for you. And this is a time when the dentist or the other dentist should see that they protect the patient, uh, the protect the patient's interest and also their fellow dentist. And each of these 10% of the clients would tell their dis dissatisfaction to more and more people. And that would lead to a bad repetition, which will take years to overcome. So as Kent said, 70% of the incidents progress to a lawsuit in lieu of an early apology, which means if you say, I'm sorry, this happened, you know, uh, it was not uh, uh, intended to do, that does not escalate into an anger or any formal complaints. So it's always better to say an early apology and then work out on that rather than escalate the matter. So... So as I told you, the Dentist Act 2014, the revised act, 
I'm not going to read all of them, but I just wanted to throw some light on the importance of this act. I'm sure you all might have uh, taken your oath and understood all of these. Just a few pointers, my dear friends, as I go through this dentist act. The short title, you should not write any uh, degrees uh, which is not uh, you know, associated with the association and you should not also add any um, uh, what should I say, uh, any prefixes uh, which is not, uh, uh, you know, eligible, which you are not eligible to. The Code of Ethics also talks about the character of a dentist. Uh, this holds good for male dentists and female dentists. So if there is a male dentist practicing and if there's a female patient walking inside, it is always better to have a female attender and uh, try to be courteous, sympathetic, friendly and helpful and polite and dignified as you work. The same holds good for uh, ladies too. So most of uh, the dental colleges today are 80% of them are women uh, and understanding this uh, women population, uh, you know, it is always better you also have one male attender or another attender within your operatory as you practice so that you can maintain your dignity. Next is maintaining good clinical practices. So this is when you have to improve your knowledge, when you have to improve your clinical acumen, you have to be in association uh, with a good rapport with the other uh, dentists, have a good camaraderie, attend CEME, CDE programs, attend these seminars. And I'm so thankful for the entire organizing committee of Pulp 2022 to organize such a wonderful CDE program. I was only uh, able to see it today, but I had a ball of a time from the beginning. Maintenance of dental and medical records, like I showed you in the video in the previous uh, session, you need to maintain records at least for a minimum of three years, whether it is models, whether it is anything you work on, all this have to be maintained. And in case you have to submit uh, any untoward, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever uh, reactions in the patients, you have to be very watchful and see that. And today we also do a hard copy along with a soft copy. So digitalize as much as possible. That will help you in easy and quick retrieval. Display of your registration number is very important. Don't use any unnecessary degrees which you have not qualified into. When you're prescribing drugs, be sure you have understood the medical uh, and the dental history and only prescribe the drugs which is necessary. Highest quality assurance in patient care is very important and don't do any unethical conduct or quackery. Uh, this is not allowed and even child abuse. And today we have something called the POSH Act or prevention of uh, you know, sexual harassment, especially for women. So it is very important you know these acts and work accordingly. Payment of professional fees especially is very important and no cure, no payment is unethical. So it is always understandable that you can collect your fees properly. Another thing is, uh, you know, the rules, like most of uh, the dentists today also have uh, some medical, uh, you know, medicals next to them. And uh, you uh, sometimes they even dispense med medication within their practice. So it's very important to have all these act or your clinic should be under these act and only then work on it. I already spoke to you about the Environmental Protection Act and also the Biomedical Waste Management Rules. So these are also important for you to maintain all these documents, especially especially in your quality control. And signing professional certificates, uh, uh, reports, you have to be understanding if you are authorized to do so. Chapter two defines with obligations to your patients and you need to understand all of this. Try to do your BLS course or your basic life support training time and again, see that uh, you have uh, the standard of care, especially when you have to treat emergencies, have some emergency drugs within your practice and uh, don't refuse treatment to your patients in case of uh, you know any uh, gender or uh, transgender and uh, uh, HIV, religion, nationality, all this, you have to be very be careful about this confidentiality has to be maintained and patient must not be neglected at any given point of time duties of the dental surgeons and specialists in consultations most of the clinics today have consultants coming in so you should have a consultation etiquette also please do only the work for which the patient uh, has been referred to and then send them back to the original dentist this is very very important and uh, patients should uh, be very careful that you know uh, there is no transfer of patients or you should not pull patients from the other dentist so this is again something which you can be 
be liable to. Punctuality is a very important and opinions and disclosures have to be careful. Uh, treatment after consultation, again, uh, it depends on how the patient has taken up the, uh, you know, the treatment plan. And uh, patients are referred to specialists in case it is beyond your scope of treatment. It is always done that way. Indicate the cost of the treatment from the beginning so that this uh, helps the uh, patient understand. And uh, whenever the patients ask for any uh, details, see that you give it under your letterhead and also uh, your name, your designation your degrees, your registration number, uh, especially should be mentioned. And if you are a part of any association, you can mention that too. Chapter four deals with the responsibility of the dental surgeons to one another. I had already explained to you well in detail on all this. And in case you are uh, going out of station, see that you have a substitute in your place and uh, monitor the substitute um, in case they have done any procedures. Chapter 5 deals with dentists as good citizens and as a part of a big community uh, health. So uh, you need to work under a team and uh, get your job done in a most, uh, you know, appropriate way. Chapter 6 deals with unethical acts. So it is very important. See, right now with a lot of social uh, media influx, uh, it is very difficult to say uh, what is a good or ethical uh, practice in terms of, uh, you know, advertisements. So you can do subtle marketing if you want to, uh, but never indulge in direct or surrogate advertisements. Uh, that is absolutely wrong. Uh, so please avoid that. And uh, soliciting formal announcement in the press, you can only do it when you're starting your new practice, when you're shifting your practice, you're changing your address, you're doing something, new services or equipments have been bought, you're maintaining a website or insertion into any internet or directory. So these are the times when you can do it. Next is when you are actually uh, having a board. Uh, again, this is something which I have been subjected to many times. Uh, many times people ask me, what is the size of the board? I'm sure all of us know that. So don't have your board beyond that particular size and uh, never have any flickery light or, uh, you know, these uh, multicolored boards are not uh, used for doctors. Uh, these are very important and any copyrights or any patents have to be maintained. And uh, see that, uh, you know, uh, everything is according to the usual standard of care of a practicing dentist. Uh, unethical practices could also be in terms of, uh, you know, using certain abbreviations, uh, which is not allowed in dentistry. Many a times when you see people doing that, you can tell them as a friend, uh, but, uh, you know, nothing much can be done if they uh, choose to do that even after uh, you have, uh, you know, warned them. Uh, naming and styling of a dental est establishment. Again, that is not uh, actually uh, allowed. Many of uh, the dentists Dental clinics today are called dental spas. Uh, I, I beg to uh, defer there. But however, it is very important. We need to understand uh, the importance of that. Signing of certificate, uh, uh, whether, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, anything which is beyond the purview of your signature, you should understand that. And patient doctor sexual misconduct uh, is uh, really taken into, uh, uh, you know, pen penalty. So we need to be very careful and always abide uh, to the laws of the land. Next is the relationship with pharmaceutical companies. Again, uh, you know, monetary grants or gifts or travels and you know hospitality all this which is beyond uh, your uh, capacity please don't do that it could be uh, you know short term gains but long term um, ripple effect on your profession so uh, try to avoid any such uh, uh, you know uh, what do i say uh, any such uh, uh, two way transactions on this and uh, marketing again is very important uh, but however as i told you make it very subtle and uh, patients interest should never be compromised at any given point of time and uh, always uphold the professional integrity and freedom chapter 7 talks about punishment and i would like to dwell a little into this because uh, you need to understand that any professional misconduct if it is sent to the dental council of india or it is uh, you might be you know uh, prosecuted for that you might be found 
guilty or uh, you will be uh, uh, stripped off your honor of being a doctor. And uh, sometimes uh, this could be uh, also publicized in uh, national news. So this is something which you need to be careful about. And um, refrain from anything uh, which is wrong. And in case, uh, like see, uh, during the COVID time, uh, many doctors refrained from practice. They were COVID affected. And for the larger interest of the patients, they uh, stopped their practices for some time and then they resumed when they were uh, negative. So these are the basic, uh, you know, uh, professional conduct uh, and competence which we need to show. And uh, this is very important. And any grievances uh, should be filed within 60 days. So these are the penalty under the income tax act of 1961 uh, under the section uh, 271a if you fail uh, to maintain any books of account you will have to pay a penalty of 25000 under 272a1 uh, uh, if you are not uh, complied with the proceedings or uh, you have not applied for a pan card number if you are not showing your or maintaining your accounts properly it's a default of 10000 for each default and 272a2 if you are are, uh, you know, uh, uh, not um, uh, giving notice of a discontinuation of profession. It is 100 rupees for uh, every failure. Uh, so to be a better doctor, follow the 10 C's. Uh, develop competency, commitment towards the profession, develop communication skill, learn cooperation and collaboration, be courageous and initiative, have concern for everybody, offer self-criticism, be cautious with the words and deeds, show compassion, and be cost conscious, right? So always follow the care cure model, be very empathetic, be uh, make your customer the king, as Gandhiji said, and uh, you know follow the cure dynamics. Have the right treatment, a competitive cost, and rapid healing with your best diagnostic ability. So as Ralph and Waldo Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. So this is my short journey uh, uh, in the field of medical legal systems. Uh, I graduated from Raga Central College in 1995. I went to do my medical legal systems from Symbiosis Center of Me, Dr. Majumdar, and the dignitaries on the dais uh, who awarded me the certification. And uh, this is Dr. Ramde, Advocate Ramde Mulani uh, addressing the gathering, and that's me on the uh, session. And um, uh, this is where I actually graduated uh, in 2003. And uh, this is R.K. Lakshman for all those people who understand the common man's uh, uh, pictorial uh, representation. And thereafter, uh, along with my uh, uh, you know, uh, fellow colleague and teacher, Dr. K. L. Roxana, we went on to do uh, uh, a lot of uh, talks together. And uh, this was one such talk uh, where we addressed the independent medical practitioners. So not only in dentistry, even in medical industry, uh, the ethics was not uh, well understood understood. So fading ethics is dire need for revival is what we spoke on. And we also uh, were, uh, you know, sharing uh, podiums on various uh, uh, lectures. And this is, uh, again, another uh, dental ethics and jurisprudence where we had uh, done a session. And this is at Venkateshwara Dental College and Hospital, along with the IDA Midras branch, uh, where I had presented uh, a topic. Uh, and uh, my gratitude goes to all my teachers. Uh, and uh, the list actually Actually goes on because every single day uh, I learn uh, from all my teachers and mentors and this presentation both of them is a tribute to all my teachers who made me who I am today uh, uh, for the last 32 years so um, this is in a nutshell thank you so much Mahalakshmi ma'am and the entire team uh, for this great honor uh, thank you so much and stopping my sharing any questions I'll be there too Uh, MRS, sir. Right. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. Thank you for a wonderful, excellent, and very informative lecture with a lot of video demonstration, especially your cleaning and sterilization protocols, which you showed were really very, very, very useful. I'm sure all the interns would have learned a lot. Thank you for giving good tips on ethics, your brain on informed concern, all nice acronyms which you have given. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you once again. Thank you, Madam and Rajkumar, for this, for inviting me, for sharing 
I mean, moderating Vidya's lecture. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, sir. There is a question, sir. Uh, uh, um, Vidya told me there's no questions, madam. Illa, in your name. Just, uh, sir, I WhatsApp you three questions, sir. Okay, okay, I didn't see. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> First, you mentioned no. One second, I'll just see. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, I'll just start off with the questions. Um, madam, what care should you should you take regarding medical legal aspects when working in government institutions? See, uh, when you work in a government institution, actually you're working under an umbrella. So uh, whenever it's a government institution in a private institution, as I told you about the vicarious liability, it is the canopy of the institution which is going to save your skin. Nevertheless, a doctor can be held guilty if they fail to follow a standard of care. Now, for example, let's take a case of a root canal treatment and you have used an instrument and the instrument has fractured within the canal and you have not made a note of it in your um, case sheet writing and you have failed to even inform the patient. Now, we all learned uh, in your Grossman, I'm talking about a basic endodontic book. Grossman is something which all of us read from the third year of dentistry, right? So in Grossman itself, it has been mentioned that that um, fractured instrument can also form a part of the filling material if it is actually well adapted to the wall. So if we have done done an observation, if you fail to mention that and it is not indicated, that is where uh, we have uh, not followed the, uh, the, you know, the medical legal aspect. So, but if you have written it, then there is nothing to worry about because as I had told you, uh, the, the law says no person is infallible, which means all of us can make mistakes instruments can fracture and uh, see even in instruments like mostly when you ask the traders they will say this instrument can be used only six times or three times and they say you like a flower you take out each uh, you know petal and then you can use it that way so uh, but uh, I don't know how many of us actually follow that right uh, and sometimes even new instruments can fracture but it's only that if you see any kink in the instrument, so you should uh, observe your instruments uh, before usage. So I'm just giving you one simple example. Uh, so examples like this can happen. There has been many times when we prepare a class one and the tip of the, uh, you know, the burr just fractures and breaks off or an abrasive breaks off. So all you need to do is, uh, in case you're having a rubber dam, you're safe. If you're not having a rubber dam, search out for that and then see that you have taken it out. In case you think you have not taken it out, take a chest x-ray to see if it has gone into any other part of the body. If it has not gone into any of his lung, then sure, in two to three days time, it will come out through the alimentary canal the other side. So I mean, you know, there are times uh, when uh, in our uh, clinical practices and in, uh, I see I worked in a college, I worked in Ragas for uh, 12 plus years. So uh, we have uh, encountered all these uh, kind of mishaps, but it is always important that we tell the patient and we monitor the patient. And once we are very transparent, patients understand. So if I have to underline this, I would say have a good doctor-patient communication and a good uh, informed consent before you go ahead, even with the simplest of the cases, just try to explain. You don't have to be very elaborative in explaining, but you just have to explain the basic contents of your procedure. I hope Thank I you. answered. I think uh, Dr. Neelam Bajaj had asked that question. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you. Next one is how to dispose developer and fixer solutions. Oh, I had showed that in that uh, chart itself. Uh, are you able to see me? Okay. I had shown in that chart itself, the developer and the fixer solution. The fixer solution has a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, you can extract the silver content. So what you need to do is the fixer solution, keep it aside, give it to a vendor who will extract the silver. The developer solution can be thrown down the drain flush it up uh, with uh, 20 times more of water, which means if you're putting say 10 ml of uh, fluid into the sink, uh, at least, uh, you know, one liter of water gets in so that, you know, you have to neutralize it before you push it into the sewerage system. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. I'll just like to add a 
one one more thing to the fixer solution it can always be used for storing waste used amalgam which is the advisable option regarding renewal of biomedical waste contract whether monthly renewal is better or annual renewal is better please uh, always it's better to go in for the yearly contract uh, i know um, uh, it could be a little uh, you know uh, see we have, we have not um, uh, paid money to people to take and go right all this time we just removed the gloves and we threw it into a dustbin right we were not conscious but uh, now with the cea it is very mandatory that we need to uh, you know follow all the uh, rules and regulations so when i look at that when you compare the monthly this is in terms of any emi when you do it monthly you will be paying a little more than when you pay it on the yearly contract so it's always better to have a yearly contract and uh, see that this yearly contract uh, is renewable much earlier than the end of the contract suppose it is jan 1st or december 31st don't renew it on uh, december uh, next jan 1st try to get the paperwork done before uh, december 25th so that the effectiveness of this new contract comes from the next year jan 1st thank you dr vidya thank you sir i think there are many that ends the question session thank you yeah I think Dr. Neelam has asked some more questions. So, why government levies heavy charges for biomedical waste collections? Uh, Dr. Neelam, um, see, uh, this is something uh, which also, uh, uh, you know. Uh, interested me and that is how i got into this uh, almost say 20 plus years back see i used to see a lot of waste just thrown outside and uh, there was uh, no ruling uh, bodies and uh, mrs sir has been a part of this entire journey what i'm talking about he knows all the baby steps I had taken, the number of government officials we had to go through, the Stanley Medical College uh, in uh, you know Chennai uh, where they were involved, and all of us sat together and we followed the rules and we you know stipulated or formed everything and uh, made it into action. So uh, uh, right now they are going slow on the uh, charges. So not all doctors are actually penalized at even today's point of time. I can tell you many doctors who have still not got into their CEA contract. Nevertheless, it is always better to be cautious. They say prevention is better than cure. I'm sure all of us have heard that. But I will tell you today, prevention is cheaper than cure. You always want to protect yourself so that you, know, you don't get into any liabilities. What you can do is you can have a professional indemnity insurance, which you can actually insure yourself uh, for any um, such mishaps, especially in the medical legal and in this uh, kind. There are a lot of very uh, small subsidiary amount which you need to pay, which is actually negligible for uh, the coverage which you would get. And I'm sure uh, if you ask any insurance agent, they would be able to help you. National insurance agent is uh, one of the leading uh, uh, agents in this uh, format. I hope that helps. Thank you, thank you, dear. Thank you, sir. I, I will write my number in case you have any questions. I, I understand we have short time. Uh, you can uh, put it in the chat box so that- Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Or you can ask any of the organizers, they will also be able to give yeah. you. But anyway, I'm just putting my number. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vidya and uh, MRS, sir. Um, thank you, my, my pleasure. MRS, sir, specifically to chair uh, Vidya's. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, thank I you, know man. how much he, uh, you know, uh, uh, adores you and uh, thinks you as you so as, as her guru. So that's the reason we actually asked. Thank and you, sir, thank you, man. Thank you once again. Thank you. agreed. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, thank Vidya. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks a lot, madam. Uh, actually, uh, presenting in front of uh, role models is very difficult. 
and uh, mrs sir has been my friend philosopher guide for 32 years and mahalakshmi ma'am i always keep telling her uh, whenever i think about women and uh, making it big in dentistry uh, and you know she being the hod for so long i have always taken uh, inspiration from all of you and uh, to sit in front of all big legends uh, rajkumar again a friend for over 32 years uh, i guess you know this has been like a family uh, so thank Thank you so much to the entire uh, pulp fraternity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now if I may, <laughs> if you stop talking, then I will give you your certificate. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Vidya, for your lovely presentation, your modulation, your English. Everything is superb, uh, and your work also is actually. And thank you so much, Vidya, and thank you so much, Emara sir, for thank moderating you, and spending so much time with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am.